verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. And the congregation said, Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, I was asked to mention Jonathan will be out there with tax receipts, so make sure and get your tax receipt. Also, pull out of your uh, bulletin. There's a sheet here that's got scriptures on it, both sides. You will need those. It goes along with the sermon. And also open up to John chapter 18. That's where we're going to begin this morning is in John 18. And the title of this sermon is What is Truth? And let us start with a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of knowing you, of loving you and serving you. Father, we pray for this sermon. Grant me the words that I need to say. Grant each one of us the words we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 18, and we're going to start with verse 38. And really, I'm going to be pulling all four of the Gospels together. So a few of the things I'm going to say, you're going to say, well, that's not in the verse that you just read. Well, yeah, you're right, because we're really kind of pulling all four Gospels together. We're talking about Pilate, and at this point, the Jews have tried and condemned Jesus. And all that's left is they want to kill Jesus. But they can't do that. They no longer have the right to execute a prisoner, although sometimes they did anyway, and they kind of, sw uh, kind of swept it under the rug. Remember the martyr Stephen? They killed Stephen. But they couldn't do that with Jesus, because Jesus was a very, very public figure, and there's no way they were going to be able to kill him and just sweep it under the rug. So they're forced to go to Pilate, who is the governor, and get him to do the execution. In John 18, verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now right away, this gives you a glimpse of what the heart of these Jewish leaders was like. Here they are trying to murder the Son of God. Here they are, they've got Jesus, and in cold blood, they're going to murder him, and they don't want to go into the judgment hall of Pilate because they're afraid they're going to defile themselves. They hadn't realized that long ago they had defiled their own hearts, that long ago they had lost connection with our Heavenly Father. Shows you what Jesus was up against. Shows you what Pilate is up against. In verse 29 and 30. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. It's early in the morning, and the Jews go knocking on Pilate's door, basically, probably even get him up out of bed. And Pilate knows that this must be somebody that the Jews are wanting to deal with really fast. So Pilate goes out there, and he's expecting to see a murderer, you know, a vicious revolutionary. Instead, he sees Jesus, the most loving, compassionate face that he's ever seen in his life. And he knows something's not right here. The Jews are wanting Pilate to rule just very quickly without looking at the facts of the case. And there were some times when maybe Pilate would have done that. But the moment he sees Jesus, he stops in his tracks. Something's not right here. I'm not going to do that. The Jews wanted Jesus dead at all costs. And they didn't care what it took. They were going to kill Jesus at all costs. And as bad as the Jews wanted Jesus dead, the devil wants you dead spiritually. As bad as the Jews wanted Jesus out of the way... 
we're going to kill this guy, we're going to murder this guy. That's how bad the devil wants us to be lost. He wants to kill us spiritually. He doesn't care what it takes. He will bring to us the idea of pleasure. He'll bring to us the idea of excitement. He'll bring the idea of money. If he has to, he'll weigh us down with trouble, weigh us down with the sorrows of life. He doesn't care. He just wants us to be lost. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, we are told, we are told, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God warns us. He warns us. Put on the whole armor. We have to put on the whole armor of God if we're ever going to stand against the devil. The wiles, the subtle, the temptations of the devil. We must be studying. We must be praying. We must be working with God. We must be reconnecting our hearts, reconnecting our lives with God every day. If we have any chance of eternal life, if we have any chance of being saved, we must put on the whole armor of God on a daily basis. In verse 12 it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are fighting an enemy far superior to us. In fact, if you analyze this verse, it sounds like the devil has reserved the the most powerful of his demons for the Christians. The most powerful of his demons are working constantly on us. We are not facing human beings. We're facing the devil. He is so much greater than us, so much smarter than us, Our only hope is the mercies of God. Our only hope is a daily connection, a daily commitment with God. Every day we put on the whole armor of God. Every day we must reconnect, recommit our life to God if we have any chance of staying. If we have any chance of standing. If we have any chance of eternal life. John 18, 31. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It's not lawful for us to put any man to death. Pilate's in no mood to be messed with. He knows what's going on here. He knows that it's because of envy that they're trying to kill Jesus. He knows right away Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. They're just trying to get him out of the way. And so Pilate kind of gets a little, well, a little sassy with them. He says, well, here, well, go take him and judge him according to your law. He knew what they wanted. He knew they wanted to put him to death. Verse 33 and 34. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Now again, we're kind of pulling all the the four Gospels together here. Pilate was convinced that Jesus was innocent. After seeing Jesus, after hearing the accusations of the priest, he knows Jesus is innocent. And the priests here, they start to accuse, and the crowd starts to get into it a little bit, and Jesus says nothing. He says absolutely nothing. Pilate gets, con- gets confused. How come he's not saying anything? So Pilate takes Jesus alone into the judgment hall. So here it is, just Pilate and Jesus, and they're talking face to face. Jesus knows that the Holy Spirit is working with Pilate. The Holy Spirit is really working on Pilate's heart, trying to save his soul. That's why here in verse 34, Jesus really is saying, Are you asking this because you want to know who I am? You want to know what I'm all about? Or is this just your job? Is this just your job? Jesus is giving Pilate a chance to know him. To find out who he is, what he's all about, what his mission in this life really is. And there comes a time when Jesus asks us good church members, do you really want to know me? Do you really want to love me? 
Do you really want to know who I am and what I'm all about, or are you just playing church? Are you here to know me, to commit your heart to me, to commit your life to me? Or are you just going through the motions? Are you just playing church? Are you just kind of showing up? God calls on us to search our hearts. Like Pilate, God calls on us to search our life. He comes right to us face to face. Here I am. Let's not play church. Let's know me. Let's love me. Let's serve me. Verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Pilate is privately talking with Jesus. Just one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. And Jesus brings that question right home to his heart. And pride kind of wells up in his heart. He doesn't want to answer. He kind of answers here, uh, sassy, I, I don't know. There's probably a better word to say. But he, he strikes back at Jesus. Am I a Jew? Can you really teach me anything? Here I am, a Roman I'm superior to you. Is there really anything that you can teach me? He strikes right back. And God asks us a question. Do we really want to know the truth? Do we really want to know what truth is, what truth is all about, who Jesus is, or do we just want to drift along? In Ephesians 6, 14, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Are we going to dig into the scriptures and find out what is truth? Are we going to get on our knees and pray, Lord, reveal truth to me? Do we want to know what God has to say, or do we just want to play church? Do we just want to have our name on the roll? Are we just content with who we are and where we are in life? In Psalms 119.30, David says, I have chosen the way of truth. We have to choose the way of truth. At some point, we have to make the decision, I'm going to choose the way of truth. At some point, we have to make the commitment, I'm going to go all the way with you, Jesus. I know what you're asking of me. I know what you're requiring of me, and I choose to do truth. Just showing up every Sabbath doesn't mean you've chosen truth. Just having your name on the roll doesn't mean we've chosen truth. But we must choose. We must decide, I want truth. I'm going to do truth. In Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Not half-hearted. Not just going through the motions. Not just God bless me, just take care of me. But those who call upon God in truth. With the heart. The heart is right with God. The heart is committed to Jesus. The heart wants to love and serve Jesus. That's what God is looking for. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We must do truth. We must find out what is truth. We must commit ourselves. Jesus, I'm going to do your truth. Verse 36 and 37. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate asked Jesus, is your kingdom from here? Are you a king? Are you all about this world? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. He made it very clear. He's not wrapped up in this world. He's not all about this world except for saving us out of the world. And yet, how many Christians, their kingdom is about the world. Their kingdom is ultimately, let's make a lot of money. Their kingdom is, let's have a lot of good times. Their kingdom is, let's have a lot of fun. 
But Jesus wants a heavenly kingdom. Jesus is looking for people whose heart is right with him, whose heart is committed to him. People who are all about a heavenly kingdom. In Colossians 3, 2, he says, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. In other words, he calls on us. Our affection should be on the heavenly things. Digging into the scriptures. Learning about God. Helping people. Saving souls. Getting people into heaven. Setting our affection on the heavenly things. Not just, I'm going to make a lot of money. Not I'm just going to have a lot of fun. Not I'm all about the world. We must be all about Jesus. We must be all about others. Helping others. Saving others. In John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He's the life. Our lives should be wrapped up in Jesus. Our lives should be all about Jesus. He should be first in our heart, first in our lives. We put him first in everything. Verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault at all in him. I find in him no fault at all. After talking to Jesus, after having this short conversation, he knows Jesus is innocent. He knows Jesus has done nothing wrong. And he wants to let him go. He wants to let him go. But the rage of the priest, the crowd starts to get involved. Now we don't know, but hundreds maybe, maybe thousands of people are gathered. And all of a sudden they're starting to get going. And the priests are going. And he doesn't want to deal with that. Pilate wants to let Jesus go, but he doesn't want to have to deal with that. And some Christians, they want heaven but they don't want to have to deal with the crowd. We don't want to have to deal with the crowd. After all, the crowd laughs. The crowd ridicules. The crowd persecutes. We want heaven, but we don't want to deal with the crowd. Being just like Pilate. We must deal with whatever comes our way. Through the strength, through the grace, through the power of Christ. We must take hold of his hand. Jesus tells us, Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And who's, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus says we must deny ourselves. Sometimes we've got to deny our pleasure. Sometimes we've got to deny our fun. Sometimes we've got to deny our excitement and take up the cross. Whatever we have to face for the sake of Jesus, we take up the cross. Whatever we have to go through for the sake of Jesus, we take up the cross. We take up the cross through his help, through his strength, through his power. We must take up the cross. The devil throws trials. We take up the cross. The devil throws temptations. We take up the cross. Through God's help, through God's power, we can't do it by ourselves, but we put on the whole armor of God. God enables us to take up the cross. In Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What profit is there to us if we gain the whole world, we have fun, we have pleasure, we have excitement, but we miss out on heaven. What good is it to go to church for years and not commit yourself to the Lord? What good is that? Jesus says, how many are giving a little bit of fun, a little bit of money, a little bit of thrills in exchange for their souls? We must take up the cross. We must follow Jesus. We must go all the way with Jesus. Pilate here. 
He asked the right question, what is truth? What is truth? But the clamoring of the mob, the crowd outside starts yelling, and he has to go deal with the crowd before he gets an answer. And how many people, they have the chance to know what is truth, but the clamoring of the mob, the crowd, the money, the pleasure, the excitement, keeps them from seeking what is truth. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, the God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, whose image of God should shine unto them. The devil brings up all kinds of things in our lives to blind our minds from the truth. We hear truth. We come to church. We know what we ought to do. The devil throws the possibility of money at us. The devil throws the possibility of excitement at temptation. The pretty girls, the pretty boys. He tries to distract us. He does all he can to keep us from committing ourselves to Jesus Christ. We must take up the cross. We must take up God's cross. We must go all the way with Jesus. We must commit our hearts, our lives, our all to him. Pilate. Pilate. He might not have had all the truth. He didn't. But that's not the problem. The problem is he did not do what he knew to be right. How many of us? We may not have all the truth. You might honestly say, I don't understand Romans 11. You might honestly say, I don't understand Galatians. Okay, that's one thing. But are we doing what we know to be right? Are we doing what we know to be truth? In the judgment, I don't think God's going to ask you, do you know Romans 11? Do you know Romans 12? I think he's going to ask, are you doing what you know to be right? Pilate did not do what he knew to be right, and that was his downfall. Are we doing what we know to be right? Luke 23, 6 and 7. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged into Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Pilate had just declared Jesus innocent. Should have been it. It should have been over. He should have immediately released Jesus. But he didn't do that. He was afraid. And he starts coming up with all these excuses not to do what he knew was right. He hears about Herod being there. And he says, well, Jesus really is under Herod's jurisdiction. So he sends Jesus over to Herod. He says, I'll let Herod deal with this. And how many Christians are coming up with all these excuses and all these reasons not to do what they read in the Bible? Read it right here. It's very plain. But if I keep the Sabbath, I'll lose my job. I've got to provide for my family. If I don't tell the truth here, I might get in trouble. We come up with all kinds of reasons, all kinds of excuses not to do what God's Word says. It's okay to take a little bit from that company there, a rich company. It's okay to deceive a little bit. They tried to deceive me first. How many of us come up with all kinds of excuses not to do what God says in his holy word? Jesus tells a couple parables in Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27. In verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built this house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Jesus tells of how a contractor, or a man, he goes and builds his house upon a rock. He's got a great foundation. Now that was kind of hard. It took extra work took extra effort to build the house on the rock, but the man did it. And when the rains came and the storms came, the house stood 
because it was built on the rock. But then he tells the next parable, verse 26 and 27, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. In the second parable, the man builds his house upon the sand. It was so much easier. It was so much nicer. He could just easily build his house, but he didn't have a foundation. So when the storms came and the winds blew, the house fell. And Jesus says, everybody who hears these sayings of mine, who knows what is truth and does it, they're like the ones who stand. When the trials of life come, and they will come, when the storms of life come, these people have a rock-solid foundation. They take hold of my hand, they take hold of my strength, and they stand. But those people who hear the truth, and they don't do it. They hear the truth and they compromise. They're like Pilate. When the storms of life come, when the rains come, they fall. They fall spiritually. They may still be in church. They may still be an elder, but they fall. They fall in spiritually because they're not doing what they know to be right. Pilate. He sends Jesus over to Herod and he's trying to get Herod to make the decision. And how many people, they're trying to get others to make their eternal decision for them. When we say, well, I can't keep Sabbath, my spouse will be mad. I can't keep from lying, my job will be mad. I can't be a Christian, the government will be mad. We're letting somebody else make our eternal decision for us. In the judgment, it's just me and Jesus. In the judgment, it's just you and Jesus. And he's not going to say, well, your pastor said it's okay, so that's all right. He's not going to say, well, your spouse was mad at you, so that was all right. The real question is, are we doing what we know to be right? John 18, 39 and 40. But ye have a custom that I should release... Unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Pilate here, he refuses to do what he knew was right. He knew here, Jesus is innocent. And what he should have done was declared him innocent called out the soldiers and given Jesus the bodyguard and just marched right off. That's what he should have done. But he didn't want to do that. It was too hard. It was too difficult. He compromises. He comes up with this idea. Now, I remember that we can release one prisoner to you all. And he thinks that, well, if I put Barabbas, the murderer here, and Jesus, the teacher, the healer here, surely the crowd is going to demand Jesus. He thinks that he can compromise and get away with it. And the longer we put off doing what we know to be right, not the easier it gets, the harder it gets. It doesn't get easier when we compromise. It gets harder. Some Christians think they can wait. We'll just wait a week. We'll just wait a year. Next year we'll do what's right. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. Pilate didn't have all the truth. But the problem was, he wasn't doing what he knew to be right. We may not have all the truth, but are we doing what we know to be right? John 19, 1-4. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. He had him whipped. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. A 
Again, Pilate compromises. He thinks that if he has Jesus beaten, he can then present the beaten Jesus, the bloody Jesus before the crowd, and the crowd will say, oh, that's enough, we've seen enough, go ahead and let him go. But the moment that he did that, the Jews, the leaders, they realized that this guy is compromising. And if we just push a little bit harder, if he's going to have Jesus who's innocent, beaten, if we just push a little bit harder, he's going to kill Jesus. And that's exactly what we want. And when we compromise, sometimes we think this compromise is going to work. This compromise is going to make everything okay. The devil sees this compromise. And just like the Jews, they begin to push even harder. When the devil sees this compromise, he just pushes harder. He pushes harder. He knows that we're already walking towards the edge. He knows push a little harder. He can push this over. It was a difficult sacrifice. The longer Pilate was waiting, the harder it was getting. If he had immediately done what was right, it would have been hard, but he could have done it. And now he's just wasting his time. He's making it harder. It gets hard. It gets hard. The longer we wait, the harder it gets. And there are some things that are hard. They are. Nobody said being a Christian was easy. Nobody said the things that we face being a Seventh-day Adventist is going to be easy. They're not easy. God knows they're not easy. That's why he says put on the whole armor of God. That's why he says to seek him every day. We need his help. We need his strength. We can't do it without him. We cannot. Ephesians 6.18 Praying always, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance. Keep at it. Keep at it. And supplication for all saints. It's hard sometimes being a Christian. It's hard sometimes doing what is right. It is. But God is there to help us. God will help us the more we ask. God will strengthen us the more we ask. Every time we ask sincerely for help, we get help. Every time we ask sincerely, give me strength, God, this is hard. We get strength. We get courage. He's there to help. He never says, here, go do it on your own. He never says, this is the requirements, you go take care of it. He's always there to help if we will ask. He's always there to strengthen if we will ask. John 19, 6. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. The stakes are turned up now. Pilate hears it. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is a divine being. And he gets scared. I'm dealing with a divine being here. He wanted, he wanted to let Jesus go, but it was so hard. And he didn't feel like having to deal with the crowd. Didn't feel like having to deal with the priests. And there's going to be times when we don't feel like doing right. I won't ask you to say amen to that one. There's times we don't feel like doing what is right. It's so much easier doing what is wrong. It's so much easier just drifting along. But we've got to reject our feelings. We have to reject our feelings. Think about Jesus who died for us. Think about Jesus. The whole reason we're here, the whole reason we're here is Him. He didn't feel like dying on the cross. It was hard. It was painful. He even cried out, if there's another way to save those people, let's do it. But he rejected his feelings. And through the strength and the power of God, he did it. He did it. We've got to reject our feelings. Through the strength, through the power of God, we do what the Bible says. We do what he tells us to do. It's not always easy. 
God will help us. It's not always fun, but God will reward us ultimately. Now the devil, he's going to tell you you don't have to do it. Whether he tells you himself, whether he speaks through somebody around you, somehow, some way, he's going to tell you you don't have to do that. You don't really have to do that. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, get this, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't love the truth enough to do it. The truth was hard. The truth wasn't always easy. They suffered over the truth. They said, we're not going to do the truth. He continues, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The truth is not always easy, but God helps us to do it. The truth is not always fun, but God strengthens us to endure it. Sometimes we might suffer for doing what is right. Sometimes we might suffer for keeping God's Sabbath. We may get fired from our jobs. Our spouse might walk out the door. But we do what God calls us to do. He will give us help. He will give us strength. He will see us through. Matthew 27, 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, this is Pilate, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. God was trying to reach Pilate. God wanted to save Pilate. He even gave Pilate's wife a dream. And she sent a message into Pilate saying, don't condemn him. Whatever you do, don't condemn him. He's innocent. God was really working to help Pilate. And God is working to help us. He sends angels. He sends Jesus. He sends the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want us lost. God will send every angel out of heaven to help us if need be. God will pour the Holy Spirit in full measure if need be. We have to ask for help and resolve we're going to do right. We ask for strength and resolve through his help, through his power, we're going to do what he calls us to do. Matthew 27, 23, and 24. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that, he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Pilate now realizes he can't save Jesus and his career too. So he chooses his career. How many Christians are doing that? They see they can't keep Sabbath. They, say they, can't, they see they can't keep their job. They choose their job. Choose their job over God. Pilate's problem? He knew what was truth and he didn't, know, and he didn't do truth. We got to do truth. We've got to follow truth. Pilate here tries to wash his hands. He basically says, it's not my fault. You guys are to blame. But it was his fault. Ultimately, it was his fault because he should have let Jesus go. He had the chance, and he didn't do it. Pilate here. He thought by condemning Jesus, he would save himself. And that's not what happened at all. A few years later, Pilate was recalled, and many believed that he ultimately committed suicide. Pilate, he knew what was right, and he didn't do what was right. As we pray, we are going to pray. If there's something in your life you know you're not doing, ask God to help you. If there's a, what is right, what is truth, and you know you're compromising, you know you're not standing for truth, pray, ask God for help. Let's pray. 
Father, we ask and pray for your help. If there's things that we should be doing and we're not doing it, help us to do it. Lord, if we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing and we know we need to make changes, help us to make those changes. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.